column. The men on rafts or cargo nets surely fared the best, because sharks would hunt and tear apart those dangling from a vest. The wounded men who died in pain, released to sink at will, would be attacked by savage sharks like jackals on a kill. Throughout the day into the night, you'd hear a sudden scream, a shipmate being drug below was like an eerie dream. This night drug on a head would droop. And sailor fall asleep. He'd wake to find his shipmate gone, conscripted to the deep. The morning sun came out in force, a blistering second day. Their strength was zapped and blinding like no place to get away. The blazing sun, roving sharks, tantamount to cursed, was never near the albatross as constant yearning thirst. All sailors from their boot camp days were schooled. Cut and dry, don't drink the water from the sea, or you will surely die. When still no sign of rescue came, the day was number three. Their hope was gone, and several drank the water from the sea. As men dozed off and woke again, their dreams were interspaced with sips of milk or lemonade that had a salty taste. A group of 39 Marines had sailed upon the ship. Their captain swam to comfort them, heroic leadership. He and the chaplain gave their all. Themselves they would deprive, exhaustion finally took its toll and neither did survive. Some men who drank the salty brine in desperate, weakened state take off their vests and swim for shore as they hallucinate. When heat and sharks and constant thirst and loss of hope combine, the logic leaves and normal men slowly lose their mind. Heroic men of Indy's crew were dying by the score, not knowing if their service did a thing to end this war. The normal life expectancy to use the K-pop vest was just two days. Now twice that long would undergo the test. The men could barely keep their chin above the water line. The soggy vest had been in use beyond its short design. As second day of August dawns, Lieutenant Wilbur Gwynn is cruising at 4,000 feet in his Ventura Twin. A tiny speck, an oil slick, comes faintly into view. He circles low and witnesses what's left of Indy's crew. Scattered in an oblong shape some 13 miles or more are men still fighting for their lives on day number four. He squawks a message back to base. Soon help is on the way. Planes and ships are racing in all throughout the day. The rescue efforts carry on throughout the day and night. And drifting men with little hope still find the strength to fight. Was it the Lord or folks back home that kept these men alive? Our message deep within the brain that says, I will survive. 1196. Both Navy and Marine, and those who come back out alive, 317. The Indy story isn't done. One fact we can't ignore, the secret voyage she had made just seven days before. A cargo loaded on the ship, delivered by the crew, exactly what it might have been. They never had a clue. These men had carried on their ship the first atomic bomb. Offloaded it at Tinian, an island close to Guam. Then Colonel Tibbetts, in his plane he called Enola Gay, would fly it to Hiroshima and drop it straight away. What if we hadn't dropped the bomb that fatal August day, when 80,000 human lives were vaporized away? Some folks have said to drop that bomb, one had to be to pray. But they don't know, and facts are clear how many lives it saved. One night before the A-bomb set Hiroshima aglow, 100,000 lives were lost in raids on Tokyo. This loss of life would have been dwarfed by death across the land from bombing raids just prior to the great invasion plan. And that invasion would have robbed a million of their lives. A quarter million U.S. troops would never see their lives. Sleep well, John Rosano, Jr., and you men of Indy's crew.
both Navy and the Corps. You served with pride and did your part to end that awful war.